directly related to the great commission where Jesus said to go out and make disciples. But we as a church are not just in the business of making any kind of Christians. We're seeking to make disciples who are open to and growing in the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. In the ninth chapter of Matthew, Jesus calls his disciples to follow him. He confronts the Pharisees with regard to hypocrisy. He heals the woman with the hemorrhage. He raises a girl from death to life. He heals two blind men. He casts out demons, and one from a demonic who had been made mute. The crowd said, never has anything like this been seen in Israel. Then in verse 35, it says, Jesus went about the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. This is what you call making a splash in your community. Then in verse 36, it says, when Jesus saw the crowd, he had compassion on them. For because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. So I'll say it again, our goal is not just to make any kind of Christian. Our goal is to make Christian disciples who are open to the fruit of the Spirit growing in their lives. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The text says, there is no wall. I always think that's kind of funny. Because why would there be a wall against things that are so dangerous? Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, be present with us in our search for truth and understanding, faith and faithfulness. Bless the meditations of my heart and the hearing of these words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have you ever felt like a sheep without a shepherd? Have you ever felt harassed and helpless? If so, this passage teaches us that Jesus feels compassion towards you and towards us. I was watching a webinar this past week on church marketing, which at first sounded kind of cold and businesslike to me. But then the presenter shared the purpose of what he called church marketing, and he said, it is the management of perception. Management of how your church is perceived by others. And he said you're involved in it, whether you realize it or not. He said it's related to how you think your church is perceived by others. And then it has to do with how you hope someday your church will be perceived in the future. And it has to do with what you can do about the perceptions that other people have of your church in the here and now. To correct maybe misconceptions or misperceptions. 
He says, marketing your church isn't just related to your Facebook advertisements and the signs outside your buildings. It's also related to your grounds, whether or not they're taken care of, the building, how it looks. I've always thought, one, and I, I, I don't know, I, I should give credit where credit is due, but when the people who built this building built it, there was this brilliant marketing move that they made. They put a small parking lot in front of a big one in the back. So it makes us look like we got a packed house about every day of the week. People are like, what's going on at your church all the time, you know? So like we have a choir practice on Thursday night and people think we got a packed house. It's kind of funny. But the one big thing that I think about in this regard is, are we perceived as a church that's inward focused or outward focused? See, because I we're a real relational church. We tend to connect with each other fairly well. Sometimes what can happen is people start to perceive, yeah, that's an active church, a good church, but it's very inward focused and focused on the people who are our day. Okay. And then the question arises, how do you correct that perception? How do you become a church that is perceived as being our focus and concern, not just about those who are here, but also those who might. Over my sabbatical, I had a sabbatical this summer, which was a, a two-month period for a rest and renewal, renewal for pastors. And during the sabbatical, my wife and I went to visit a lot of other churches. And one of the funny things was, is, is like some churches were pretty good at greeting, but others weren't good at it at all. There are several churches we went to this summer and nobody greeted us. Not even a hello. Or the only hello we got was from the official greeter at the door. And it made me think, I'm like, you know, it's really hard when you're a church that's relational in nature, like a lot of covenant churches are, to even be aware of the new faces who are walking in the door, enough to say hello. Um, it's interesting, too, that we weren't really all that affected by it. It wasn't like we didn't walk out going, oh, I'd never come back to that church because nobody greeted us. It was more like, we were like, wow, you really have to work hard at breaking into this box. You know what I mean? So you don't want to walk in and have people pounce on you. You'd be like, whoa, you know. But at the same time, I felt better about the church that I, that I thought greeted us fairly well. And I was like, okay, they, and I even told the pastor on the way out the door, I said, you guys want the best greeting. Um, and they were good at it. We got, and it wasn't like, like I said, it wasn't like people pounced on us when we walked in the door. It was people looked us in the eye and said, good morning, or welcome, it's nice to see you. Simple as that. So the question is, though, are we inward focused or outward focused? Are we looking in? You know, and I, and I realized, too, that some of that was just people were glad to see each other. People were talking to each other. There were, like, pumps of two or three out in Norfolk or the lobby of the church. And people were talking to each other, and you could tell that relationships mattered to them. It's just they were focused on the inside. Jesus looked at the people, and they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Let's think about that for a moment. What's the difference between a sheep with a shepherd and a sheep without a shepherd? In Psalm 23, we, we say or pray these words. We say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. When we pray, the Lord is my shepherd, we're acknowledging that we're in a relationship with him. And there's something different about someone who can say, the Lord is my shepherd someone who can And you can see how having that relationship with God can give you a sense of confidence about life that helps you to avoid feeling helpless and harassed. That doesn't mean there aren't things in our lives that make us feel 
feel helpless and harassed. But the thing I'm becoming more and more convinced about is that God doesn't need you to look at yourself as a perfect person reaching out to imperfect people. He wants you to be a person who can pray, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Somebody who's in a relationship with God who can tell somebody else about what it's like to be in a relationship with God. Our old superintendent, George Elias, some of you may remember him, he, he used to say, uh, evangelism, evangelism is one beggar helping another beggar to find food. Right? It's not, a, it's not a perfect person trying to help an imperfect person to become perfect like them. It's one imperfect person helping another imperfect person to understand what it means to be in a relationship with God. You see, we need to have compassion on people who don't have that relationship. People who are living their lives like a sheep without a shepherd. If you read Psalm 23, it's great to read that text as if you yourself were a sheep. And when you become, when you claim God as your shepherd, you become a follower, right, of the good shepherd. And you're in a relationship with him. Once again, in the Matthew text, verses 37 through 38, Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. See, this metaphor is about things that grow and the fruit on the tree. My wife, Carolyn, and I used to live in Connecticut, and we lived right next to or behind or in front of, I'm not sure which direction you call it, but uh, an apple orchard. And people came from all over Connecticut to go pick apples at this apple orchard. And it was always amazing to me how well pruned all the trees were, but also how much fruit those trees produced. There were always tons of apples. But you also saw a lot of apples on the ground, and you realized some of that was just people trying to pick and not doing a very good job of it and not fall on the ground, right? But if you leave fruit on the trees and they don't get picked, a lot of them just fall off the rock of the tree, right? So here's the deal that the harvest is plentiful, that the laborers are few. There's a lot of people who call themselves Christians in our society. There's a lot of people who say, yes, I'm a Christian. But the harvest is plentiful, and the laborers are few. What this means is there's not enough compassion in our hearts as Christians to be concerned with those who are harassed and helpless. That's the difference between an inward focused church and an outward focused church. It's, it has to do with our compassion towards those who need to know God and who need to know the direction of being open to and receptive of the Holy Spirit producing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Again, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. And here's the question. Who doesn't want that in their lives? Who doesn't want it in their lives? That's what we want. <coughs> Excuse me.
Man, I was getting to a good point. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for reminding me of the good point I was making. So here's the thing. <coughs> Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And what I think he wants to be able to say is the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are abundant. Do you hear that? The laborers are plentiful. Or the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are abundant. In other words, we all get it. We get the good news. We get the sense of direction that people are looking for in their lives. We get their desire for God. And we want to go out and share it with others. So let's keep being inward focused on each other. But let's also be outward focused on our community, on the people we interact with on a weekly basis. And let us be a part of that abundant pool of laborers. Amen. <coughs> I'm going to use.